joined us. So if I share the PDF that came out on the email, did you see this, Natalia? Did you um, see the, it looks like that? No, I did, oh my God, no, I didn't. Okay, so right, on, I, I on that. It, it long time ago, I'm sure. On, would... on the Thursday email that I send to you, I attach, I attached the thoracic spine. How are you opening my emails on your phone? Yeah. You probably need to get a bigger screen. You yeah, can't I... see all the attachments. Yeah, okay, what... either either I... an iPad or a, li a laptop. I googled myself and I printed. Uh, Is I don't know if you can see me the the sections of spine. Okay, so I I I've read and I've read the bones and joints of the skeleton. <laughs> so on the how far have you gone on to the next part of the um, portal? Are you looking at the, the skeleton when you were able to go to the next stage? Is that what you went to? Yeah, that that's where I went. I didn't okay. manage to do any any homework. That's fine. I've just so printed. That. Identity the main bones and joints of the skeleton. Right. Okay. So it as a rule, as a rule, Natalia, we should give you the information to learn. Yeah. You learn it and we check. You shouldn't need to go off anywhere else and find. So you shouldn't have to Google. You might yeah. want to Google to find certain Thank elements you. of it. But we should be giving you all the information. So in, in terms of the email that I sent out where I was telling everybody what they were going to teach, this document was attached. Okay, I will check. And um, you probably won't see it very easily at all on a, on, a, um, on a phone because the attachments aren't as easy to see. So let me show you what, because we're moving on to the thoracic spine, this is what it looks like. So just like head, neck and shoulders... we start to look at a different area of the spine. So in this document, we'll have all sorts of things. There'll be breakdown. Can you see that, Natalia? Yeah? Yeah, I see, yeah. So there'll be different elements of anatomy, which we'll look at. Okay. And, and then further down, there'll be conditions of the spine. There'll be some postures in your posture profile. So here Sam is doing half Lord of the Fishes. I think there's one where he's doing cobra so you see on this variation of cobra there's three different elements to it because you were talking about the handout so you've got a file full of the manual so you've got what is the old manual yeah and when, when you look at that I think that's possibly a little bit confusing especially when you were looking at um camel because you said I can't do it and you're very flexible so Maybe looking at the documents that come out on my emails might be easier for the postures because, or I'll drop in an image because I think what happens is when you go and Google, you get a load of other different information and people call them all sorts of things and all variations. So I think to make it easier, either I'll refer you to this document and the images in that document or ask me for a screenshot if I don't put one on there so that you know what you're working to because it, you could spend ages looking for different variations of it. And camel is quite difficult. So yeah. if, bear in mind, you've got both. You've got the manual and you're doing online. So it might be at one point you decide just to stick to one area because it might just be confusing. It might be just there might be con contradictory information in there. So let's just start with the the rest of the one video I watched, it looks exactly like what uh, Sam doing. So, yeah, it, it comes from the low uh, uh, availability, you know, then he goes deeper and then right. the last one like this. So, right. oh, well done. Okay. So let's start with the thoracic <laughs> spine. So we've done a few sessions on the head neck and shoulders let's look at the thoracic spine mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of an introduction on on how the thoracic spine particularly the organs um the thoracic spine is the only part that's actually connected to our rib cage which houses all our organs 
And so in reality, it moves slightly less because we actually want it to hold the organs in. But you can see on this image here, if I just come out a little bit more, thoracic starts at T1 here. Mm -hmm. So bottom of the, you've got the cervical spine here, T1, and comes all the way down to T12. Mm -hmm. And housing all of the vital organs within that area. Okay. Did, and if we were to turn and look at the front of the body, we can see the lungs underneath the heart and down here, the diaphragm. So this is all at the front of the body. You've got the major uh, veins coming mm -hmm. down. Lots going on in this area, which is why some of these postures that we do around the chest opening and heart opening can be quite quite effective and can be emotive because of all the things that are going on underneath and our emotions and then if we start to look a little deeper at the heart underneath there and the diaphragm which sits just under there under the ribcage we're looking up towards um, the head neck and shoulders there so this is a really whistle stop tour when you go through this section thank you when you go through this section on the portal you'll go into more detail there'll be a video and then we start to look at some of the muscles that sit within the thoracic spine. And on this first image, you've got the external intercostals and they sit within the rib cage. So they sit just inside all of the ribs, front and back. So you can see here that I've taken the reverse, the posterior view and the anterior view. And there are intercostals. On the ribs and over. No, so the rib they sit underneath the ribs and the ribs sit on top of them. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. Um and very and often if you pull um an intercostal muscle, it can it it quite likely it will affect your breathing because of the location of the rib and um the diaphragm, etc. So the location of it, it will make you probably challenge you to breathe a little differently. When mm -hmm. we come to the front, which you hear me talk about quite a lot, we've got the pectoralis major, which comes over top, of, just the top of the breast, comes to the clavicle and then mm -hmm. comes into the top of the arm. So we talk about a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of opening like this stretches the pectoralis major. Mm -hmm. And just see underneath there, we have the external oblique just underneath. And mm -hmm. I'm doing a very, very quick run through just so you can get an idea when we're doing the thoracic spine, what's happening at the front. We go down, we'll do in more detail the breast area. We've got the uh, bleak just underneath there. So all of this area, when we take the next layer off, we have the pectoralis minor sitting under the major. And then we have the mammary glands all around the breast sitting just uh, alongside that pectoralis major. So we're going a lot deeper. We're going further down at the front of the body. When we look at the thoracic at the back, you hear Brian and I talk about the trapezius muscle, this kite-shaped muscle coming down from the uh, occipital bone in the skull, down over the shoulder blades and in between the, the um, <laughs> thoracic spine there. The latissimus dorsi, the huge bandage-like muscles either side of the spine, a little bit yeah. further down. When we take all of those off, we start to get deeper. We go into the rhomboid major. Then we come into, you can see here, the infraspinatus, which is one of the um, rotator cuff muscles. And then we come down to these almost wing-like uh, muscles, the serratus anterior here. Mm -hmm. and serratus posterior the purpose of this is to give you an idea you're not going to be tested on individual muscles but what happens is when we're doing certain postures you will be able to identify that there are different styles of muscle in the back so you can see here the serratus are more wing like when we look at the long muscles that run the length of the spine like the longissimus in this case when we look at those, they're more bandage-like shapes. So we're doing certain movements. We're going to be 
working those more effectively and this is a this is a very detailed part of it ultimately when we move our body in yoga we're working all of this so the part of the anatomy is to understand what's going on under the skin but not to get overwhelmed and think oh my gosh I've got to remember which which one's the iliocostalis and which one's the longismus it doesn't really matter unless you love to look, learn like that it's to understand what's going on and probably when we get a little bit deeper into the conditions of the spine to understand because students will come up to you and want to know why they've got a bulging disc or why they've got um what very different types of um phrasing for bulging discs slip discs all sorts of things so what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of um a warm up around this area you probably will have done this with me or with Brian um and we'll play with some of those postures and let's see how we go with camel and um, the postures that you were going to teach the seated forward bend we'll play with those because like all of these you'll be able to do if if you're struggling to do camel at its full range you can absolutely guarantee your students are going to because you're much more flexible so adapting is one of the biggest things that we will do as yoga teachers to adapt a normal pose for different oh. variations yeah for the normal people yeah for the normal people that aren't like you <laughs> but are gifted with their flexibility okay so we're going to come on to our um my mat comes, uh, not when it comes because of my low back yeah no, I, well, that, that will also make you a more effective teacher natalia that will help you because you know the things that help your back yeah, and so that will make you uh, a more understanding teacher with people with back pain because you've been through it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's find if I can find a, a yoga mat that hasn't got a dog on it, I will be winning. <laughs> there will be a second. <laughs> She's ready for the lesson. <laughs> She's ready. ready for some yoga. Oh. oh. Is it Luna? This one's Pia, and Luna's oh. just asleep on the chair. Oh. <laughs> this one's this one's the beagle, chunky beagle. Yeah. Right. Which one? Which one is twenty twenty kilos? Brian it's, said with it's, to carry. One. <laughs> <laughs> twenty kilos. Aren't you? Hmm? Oh, look, she's ready for her lesson. <laughs> okay, coming on to all fours. <laughs> Is it possible, uh, Kili, to switch? Uh... Oh, sorry, I haven't stopped sharing. Sorry. So sorry, I can love. I can see myself. Yeah. So I'm in the right position. Yeah, that that's fine. Yeah, well Thank you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, I'm gonna come on to all fours. Can you get up? Well done, good girl. Okay, <laughs> so. Just going to lift. So quite a lot of the time when you're teaching online, if that's something that you choose to do, you will be up and down moving your laptop yeah. or your iPad just so you've got the right uh, vision. But it also helps to make sure that you know that your students can see you properly. So we're going to start um, with a little warm up with our happy cat, angry cats. We're oh going to take God, it's our... Oh, is it? My back, my back. Yep. Great. Knees are hip width apart. Wrists are underneath our shoulders. Take your gaze down to the floor. We're going to inhale. As we inhale, we're going to draw the tummy button towards the spine. Looking down to the mat, into our angry cats. Exhale, belly goes down to the mat. Take your gaze just beyond the top of your mat. Inhale, tummy button towards the spine. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Visualize that hold of the spine. We just looked at particularly T1 to T12 for the thoracic spine. One more each way. Good. 
coming back to center. So this is a movement that I was taught by a chiropractor, but I use as a thoracic mobilization tool. So moving the thoracic spine, because it doesn't always move as well as the two other parts of the spine, simply because of the location of protecting the organs. So this, this you can add in if you want to, Natalia. You don't have to, you can pick and choose. As a yoga teacher, you can borrow stuff from all over the place. This is just a warming up of the thoracic spine, simply before we start to move into some of the other postures. You won't find it in any of your manuals, but I'm happy to send you a video if you want to, so that you can practice it. It's entirely up to you. Your left palm goes on the back of the head, elbow goes out to the side. You're going to inhale, sweep that elbow up towards the ceiling. Lovely. Light as a feather, that palm on the back of the head. Exhale, coming down. You're just twisting that thoracic spine. Inhale, sweeping up. Hips are staying nice and still. Exhale, coming down. Inhale, sweeping up. Exhale, coming down. Inhale, sweeping up. Exhale, coming down. One more. Take your palm onto your chest. This time you're going to sweep that left arm all the way away all the way away exhale thread that left palm behind the right wrist we're not going further we're just threading this down so we've got a full range of movement inhale sweeping back up lovely exhale threading through one more inhale sweeping up exhale threading through this time the left palm goes through the left shoulder comes down to the mat with the forehead and then turn so the back of the head is on the mat, looking up towards the ceiling. That may well be enough for some of your students. Good. Breathing in, breathing out. And just gently walk the right fingertips down the mat so we get a little bit of length through the shoulder. Breathing in, breathing out. Walk the fingertips back, and if it feels okay, that right arm can sweep up towards the sky, towards the ceiling, losing sight of your fingertips if you can, stretching through the back. Breathing in, breathing in. Lowering that arm back down and uncurling yourself nice and slowly, just coming back to centre. Breathing in, breathing in. Good. Ready to go with the other side. Try this time taking your knees as wide as the mat. Sometimes that helps for a little bit more stability in the movement. Wrists underneath your shoulders. We're going with the right palm on the back of the head. Inhale, sweep the right palm up, looking up underneath the right arm. Exhale, coming down. Inhale, sweeping up. Exhale, coming down. Inhale, sweeping up. Exhale, coming down. One more. Inhale, sweeping up. Exhale, coming down. Take that palm and place it onto the chest. Sweep the right palm away. Take your gaze over that right shoulder. Inhale, back to centre. Exhale, sweeping away. Inhale, back to centre. Exhale, sweeping away. This time, we're going to thread that right palm all the way through. Right shoulder comes down to the mat. Turn so the back of the head is on the mat. Good, lovely. Find that position. Nice and jump into that shoulder. 
And if, if it feels okay, walk the left fingertips down the mat. Breathing in, breathing out. One more breath. Walk the fingertips back and see if you can sweep that left arm all the way away. Push the palm away. And lower the palm back down to the mat. Push your palms into the mat and gently ease yourself back. So, coming into our camel, let me just show you how I teach it. Okay. And this, I nearly, although I can do camel, I nearly always teach it this way because I just think it's softer on your neck. Mm -hmm. I tend to start with knees hip width apart. And then I'm going to encourage people to sweep their arms round and create a little base at the bottom of the spine. So my fingertips are just about in line with my coccyx, the very bottom of my spine. So I'm creating this sort of structure at the bottom of my back. At the same time, I'm opening up through the chest, through those pectoral regions, the pectoral muscles to be looked at. And then what this allows people to do, it allows you to guide them as far as they want to go. So I encourage people to gently take their gaze up. As they start to look up, you can see the back arch happening. But because you're supporting that back to a certain extent, it feels, feels safer psychologically. Now, if people say, oh, that's great, I feel really good, then you can encourage them to tuck the toes onto the mat and they may decide to go one fingertip, one palm down to the heel at the time, or they may feel really comfortable in going to two. The challenge you've got here is encouraging people to have enough strength to come out. So you kind of really want people to come down with their chin first before they come out of the movement. Otherwise, they just pull these huge muscles, the sternocleidomastoid and the platysma, they pull them as they come up. And then, then people say, oh, I don't really like doing camel. It's because of the way that they've come out. And it's quite a strong pose. Mm -hmm. So let's try that again. Let's sweep the palms around. Make that foundation at the bottom of the spine. Take your gaze up. And then encouraging maybe that left palm down to try and find the heel and then maybe the right coming into full into a pigeon. I've never taken my toes back onto the floor, so I wouldn't teach it like that. I'm not flexible enough. And if I want to come out and bring my chin to the chest, push down off my heels. And then what I would do entirely is I'd do a counter pose and come into cam uh, to child's pose to ease out of the spine. Of course. And it may be that this posture isn't great for your back, in which case you wouldn't teach it. Okay, mm. there are things I don't teach because I get migraines. I don't teach them. There are thousands of yoga postures. Do not worry that out of the 50 or so that you may have from coming through the school, if you don't like teaching one, it doesn't work for you, don't do it. Okay. Okay. So do you want to have a, a go at teaching the camel and seeing how you feel practicing that one? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so um uh I've got this uh um uh, one way like uh on manual thumb in, in three stages or I've got uh, a chair I prepared uh, uh, a sort of like wall or something in front of your thighs right uh, which one would you like me to, to do <laughs> teach the one that doesn't have a prop so teach one that you could do on the mat if you can yeah okay 
so no chair. Which chair is very gentle, very nice. I actually liked it, and yeah. it opens you because it's all about you know opening your torso, not leaning back. So it still gives you a good yeah. chance to open. Oh, I've done my knee yesterday. It, it helps oh. more than ever. Yeah. Practice. <laughs> Uh, is is it okay to use the blanket, folded blanket? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's worth. Um, I'm finding more and more students in my class are using supports underneath their knees, irrespective of age. So not necessarily the older ones, just because there's a lot of wear and tear in people's knees, and so blankets those little knee discs that you can get, lots of people using those because it's painful kneeling. So absolutely use whatever prop you need to use. And I don't know what happened to me. Uh, my knees used to be okay, but it's either I did it without support and eventually I damaged them or it's uh, down to menopause. So my knees start hurting much more than it used to be. Yeah, because all your joints have got less um, <clears throat> less estrogen in them, so you will get more painful joints, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, shall we start? Yeah, can you, can you, do you want to, to teach me through it, or do you just want to talk through it? As in, oh. do, you want, do you want to, me to do it with you? Uh, no, it's, it's up to you. It's, it's up to you. No, you can sit and relax. No, I'm gonna let you teach me is what I meant. I didn't that didn't come out very clearly. I should come over here. Can you see me on my mat? Is what I meant. What I, mean. yes, I can see you. Right. You don't you can just sit and relax. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you've done both just enough. <laughs> okay. So um we will be doing uh Ustrasana today, which uh, means camel pose, Ustrasa means camel, and it's a very challenging posture. Uh, this posture can be done uh, using a chair or props like blocks, and I highly, highly recommend to use a folded blanket or a cushion uh, to support your knees, because our knees are not uh, supported. They don't they don't have enough fat to support the knees, so our job uh, to prevent damaging our knees and folded blanket or cushion would do a very, very, very good job. So please uh, grab the blanket or cushion, uh, it's up to you. And we start in a kneeling position. Come down on your knees and spread your knees away from each other, roughly a uh, hip distance apart. Uh, you can keep your toes in, tuck them in, or you can uh, keep your uh, feet flat. It's up to you, whatever you feel comfortable with. And for beginner variation, we could start uh, with uh, toes curled under because it will be, uh, when we start doing it, it will be easier to touch the heels. Uh, listen to your body. As soon as you start feeling uh, pain or you feel uncomfortable, please come out of the posture. So, as I said, for the beginner variation, you could start with the toes curled under. Uh, place, uh, open your arms, make uh, exaggeration chest or place your palm or fist. You can make fist and place your fist towards your pelvis and start open chest and pull your shoulder blade, pull your shoulders down and uh, start moving your shoulders, shoulders blades uh, towards each other and take your gaze forward. So you open your chest, you open your heart, you open your torso. Please make sure your hips above your knees. So keep the line, the straight line, 
hips above your knees. It's not about collapsing back. It's about opening our torso, neck, heart, and uh, shoulders back. The next variation, uh, bring your hands down to your knee. Keep gazing up. Again, opening your shoulders, shoulder blades coming closer together. Lift the chest up. Engage your thigh muscles so they're nice and strong and they give you support. And there are hips in line of, with your knees. And another variation, if you want a little bit more of stretch, you place your feet down, make them straight so that the front of your feet touching the floor. And if you're flexible enough, if your body allows you, if you're comfortable with, you can touch your heels or your sole of your feet with your fingers or with your hands. It again depends on your flexibility. But please don't collapse back. It's not about going back. It's about opening the front of our torso and keep gazing forward. Keep gazing forward. Open your chest, open your heart and keep breathing. To come back, move your hands back to your low back. Make a fist if you like and push yourself back gently and slowly. Gently and slowly. And you may, if you like, if it's okay with you, sit back on your heels, on the top of your heels. Relax, release your body and slowly go into child position and stretch your the whole spine, your cervical spine, your thoracic spine, your lumbar spine. And just drop your head down, drop your shoulders back. Don't jump, don't, don't jump you, your neck. Just relax your neck, relax your shoulders. Don't squeeze your neck and just relax and release your body. And we just done Ustrasana. Brilliant. I did lots of mistakes. No, it's fantastic. That's really good. Excellent. You told me why we want to do it. You gave me support for my knees. You gave me lots of variations, which is brilliant. And um, emphasis on opening up through the torso, which a lot of people just think it's about whacking their head back. Fabulous. The only thing I would say is, you, and this is through all your poses, you have a lot of strength. And that's going to be hard for you to imagine what it's like for other people. So this but, this this adjustment. So when you did the if you think about going back, the benefit of going back and putting your palms in there is it gives you you're working less when you do that. You're having to work more because there's more balancing going on. So try to keep to this. If you're going to do that variation, keep mm -hmm. to this because this is actually harder because you, you need a lot of quad strength, you need a little core strength. And because you're strong, coming out was quite easy for you to do that. Most people will be like, I just need to get out. So they'll get out how that's the neck pulling part. But this will go through all your postures because you are strong. It's difficult when you find it easy to imagine what it's like. So it's always going to be about variations which you did which is brilliant the only thing i'm picking up is that you probably need to put your palms in there to make it a little bit easier for people if people want to work it a little bit more and they've got a lot of strength they can do that but most people if they're beginners are going to want to have that support and also so they're working slightly less because they're already trying to hold their body weight up in a slightly bizarre position but fantastic the 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 stuff that you put yourself through in here, in your head, let it go, because you are absolutely clear, lots of variations. I knew what you wanted me to do. I understood the benefits of the posture. Fabulous. That That's not an easy, none of these are easy poses to teach, because you're always having to do a variation for 
I can teach you how to teach lots of different variations all the way up here, but it'd be pointless because the people who come through your door, they won't be, some of them won't even be able to do the first part of it. So what's the point of being and doing a fantastic pose over here if the people you're teaching to can't do it? You'll look great, but they won't feel great. That was brilliant. That really good, Natalia. That is not not an easy pose to teach. Love the variations. Really good. So for for this case, I can I can do the chair. Or I can do against the wall. Yeah, yeah. Show me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You, you just need so, to bear in mind that if you were in a community hall, you probably wouldn't have all those chairs. But if you were teaching chair yoga, then if you you're, so, yeah, it's, which is great. So you grab. You grab your blanket, you protect your knees, and you put your feet under the chair. Yeah. And uh, you have to be away from the chair, maybe a hand uh, distance apart, one and a half. Start breathe, breathing in and breathing out. Open your heart, open your chest, and remember, listen to your body. You can go as far as you're comfortable, and you always can come back to where you started. Just please listen to your body. Open your chest, drop your shoulders, place your hands, your palms on a chair. You can place like this if it's okay for you. If you want a little bit more stretch, you can place your palms on the chair horizontally and start walking your palms away but keep your hips above your knees open your chest open your heart start walking your palms away slowly so your hips above your knees open your chest open your heart and gaze forward you can lift your head a little bit just don't scrunch don't injure your neck you can keep for a couple of breathes this posture, or if it's enough for you, slowly start walking back your hands, slowly and control. So we did open our chest, our heart, our torso, without leaning back, without damaging and hurting our neck. Keep breathing, couple of deep breathes, and relax. And you can move your chair away gradually and slowly. And you can position yourself on the top of your heels. And we just did gentle and nice Ustrasana. How... I like that. Yeah, yeah. and also against the wall. So when you can control your thighs so you don't go back because you're against... It's sort of mentally what I watched oh, okay. from it, it psychologically mentally gives you the feeling of safety because you're touching the wall and yeah. also you control the position of your thighs to make sure that touching That's a good one. yeah and it doesn't it doesn't give your body to lean back so you just open the part of your body which is supposed to open without going back and hurting yourself. It's interesting, really lovely. I like that, all those variations. You see how you can play? That's just one posture and that's three variations. Well, four actually, but brilliant. Really good, really good. And I got the tip about L shape, but where you have to keep your head. So you make L uh, okay. and you keep, you can put fist here and yeah. one, hand, one fist here. And you just go Lovely. in like that. But that's sort of like, it has to be long uh, explanation, either before the posture, so sort of like preparation. You can't do posture and talk at the same time because of the age, you know. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. The, um, yeah. And also you might want to, so if you were teaching in on Zoom or online, you may want to demonstrate it and then 
as you talk people through, come out and watch the screen so that people aren't doing, because what you just said there, that L is perfect. People will do this. And then the shoulders have come up. Very well, we keep our tension in here. They'll just do this and they'll come out and go, oh, whenever I do that pose, I really don't like it. That's why you're watching your screen. You'll be like, right, remember the L, remember this part. We don't want to be jamming the neck. So whilst, although you're teaching, you're also monitoring how the student does it, just as though you would do if we were both in the room together. So yeah, you're right. It's a, You can't be teach length. It's a really lengthy explanation and they're sort of struggling to get out. So it's that's why the practice is is important before you start doing yeah. it. Brilliant. But Love it. with the chair, you still have the stretch without you know uh, fear of uh, falling back down. And also the knees, this uh, blanket is great. Yeah. Oh, good. And then if you if you think about so let's think about people who aren't that mobile who couldn't necessarily sit back on their heels. There's nothing to say that when we're taking this right down to the other end of the scale of people who can't move, just sitting with your back towards that chair, just as you were with their legs out in front, even just drawing their arms around behind them gets that opening of the pectoral muscles, yeah? And they're just seated. So there's lots of variations depending on who you choose to teach you may it might be that vinyasa flow is your thing and you don't ever teach at this sort of level but it is worth remembering that the community out there needs yoga teachers to be able to do all variations of that absolutely um, yeah because not everybody has that they might want to do yoga but they may not be as flexible as, as you or i so giving those variations that's brilliant natalia well done and um, you are flexible. Well, I don't consider myself flexible. Oh wow, you are. Wow. Your, knee, your knees can be in pain, or you never done this before, and you're not terribly flexible. You know, going back will be flexible to go forward. Yeah. Again, maybe you just need to build, or you can't do it without knee. You know, knees hurting or something else. So yeah, absolutely, especially as. As you mentioned earlier, you know, menopause with women struggling with all sorts of wrist pain for joints, yeah. knee pain, back pain, all sorts of things. So having to make those variations of kneeling on a blanket or a, a rolled up mat, absolutely perfect. Have you, um, just on a side note, have you been to Sam's age concern class yet? No. See what happened. Uh, when you gave me uh, these two choices, and I, I, I've chosen 27th, but then we had class with him, and he said oh. uh, 20th or some other day, and I didn't want to interrupt the class. I said, okay, I will confirm with him oh. it with the email, because I need to make my plans for the week i thought maybe he doesn't want me 27th you know maybe there are some other changes so i sent him an email about 27th and he didn't reply the reason I'll, I'll, i will follow that up with um sam but I, the reason i was mentioning that is because um we're going to do another round of uh, age concern um you frozen teaching, sorry so you'll be able to you'll be able I to just come wait um uh... When we do the next round, you'll be able to come along and... Um, I don't know. We, we just um, renewed our modem literally like three days. Oh, you're back. It's, it's so something... The, that's all right. The, the part about the age concern, we're going to do it again, so you will be able to um, experience it. But when you go to the age concern classes, you'll be able to see just how wide the remit of... Uh, cool. flexibility is so it's a reminder because we all sit in our own classes and, and that's a barometer of the overall fitness and yeah. the, the age concern are just immense you know there's there's people who just sit on a chair because they can't do anything else and that's the reality of what we're teaching so it'll be a good experience for you to do I think it's October we're going to do some more so we, you'll get a chance to see how they are do you um do you want to teach your seated forward bend? Yeah, we'll see. It's quite boring. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> very good. It's a good posture, yeah. So um you you can see me, yeah? Or okay, do you want to uh, yeah, move yourself up slightly. Yeah, like that, yeah. Okay. So uh we will do back stretch. Uh Paskita Masana. Sounds uh, very interesting and challenging as well. Pashimatanasana, yeah. Yeah. I will do, you know, just simple classic uh quick um version. So we start uh with a sitting in sitting uh position. Uh sit with your legs stretched in front of you, palms on the floor besides the hip. Make sure you have you sit on your tailbone and with the your spine stretched up nicely and crown of your head uh in one line with your uh back and your hips. Start breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in. Uh, may I just um, add, if you like, if you feel you're not uh, flexible enough, you can use the uh, band to help yourself um, to bend forward. Uh, please, if you need it, please, please do. Please use it. So on next exhalation, uh, we will start bending forward from our hips joint. Make sure you, you keep your uh, back stretch, spine stretch, and we start bending forward uh, from our hips, slowly and controlled. You can use your belt to help you uh, bend forward. We reach our feet or your shin as far as you're comfortable, as far as it's okay for you. You can release your belt and bend forward even more. Keep breathing. Drop your shoulders. Keep breathing in and out. In and out. Try to bend a little bit more, just a few millimeters more. Give your back the whole spine nice, good stretch. Stay as, as long as you're comfortable with. Keep breathing in and out, and slowly on next exhalation, start walking back your palms on your legs. Sit upright with your palms on the floor besides your hip. The spine stretched up, the head is nice and proud. Breathing in and breathing out and release. Lovely. Excellent, great stuff. Have you um can you lay your hands on a belt, Natalia? Could be any type, could be um a band or um anything. Oh, fabulous. So the benefit of using uh the belt in, in the way that we teach is um if people can't reach there, so again, not a problem for you because you're flexible. But when people are tight, what they'll try to do is they'll the shoulders will come up and they'll just try and get to the toes. And so all the lengthening that you've just done and all the lovely part that you've encouraged them to lift and come forward is kind of lost because they're just desperate to get to their feet. And then again, the same thing happens. It feels uncomfortable through the neck and the head and they're just they're just struggling. The benefit of using the belt, when you put it around the balls of the feet and then you slide your palms up the belt, is that you can use the belt to lever you forward. But that movement of taking your elbows out to the side means you soften through the, the middle of the back, which allows them to lengthen forward. So what you and I do naturally by lengthening and coming down doesn't happen when you're really tight in the hamstrings and the calves it becomes a this, this is exaggerated. So rather than people doing that, use the belt and get them just to be a little bit more upright. They probably, to you as a teacher, don't look like they're doing very much, but their hamstrings and their calves will be absolutely screaming because they're tight. So mm -hmm. get them to use the breath, use the belt, 
belt is a great prop to have. Just allow them to have a couple of breaths. It doesn't matter that their head's not near there or they're not touching their toes. You will see by their face that they're they frozen working. again. And a lot of people oh. have tight hamstrings, not necessarily due to sport, due to inactivity. So there might be the obvious people who run and they they bike or anything, whatever, they cycle, or whatever. But there'll be a lot of people who just through lack of movement are stiff. And yeah. so the belt is a really nice one to give because it allows them to feel the stretch without compromising anything else. And that's that's a little bit like your camel that you've just done using the chair is using a prop to allow them to feel the same benefit without compromising anything else yeah that okay. makes sense yeah yes grab your belt sit on your tailbone nice and proud and tall grab your belt it will be quite difficult for me because it's so easy for me to do. <laughs> uh, sit a little bit uh far apart yeah grab feet far wide apart that's good nice and controlled Breathing in or breathing out, start bending from your hips. Keep your back straight, your head straight in line with your spine and start bending as far as you can. Widen up your elbows, drop your shoulders and as far as you can, keep your head straight in line with your spine. Start bending down, listen to your body. Listen to your body. Keep breathing. In on next exhalation, bend a little bit more deeper if you can, but listen to your body. Keep breathing in and out. In on next exhalation, start and curl your body gradually and slowly and control and release the belt. Lovely. So yoga is not about, you, uh, about touching your toes. It's what we learn on the way down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect description. <laughs> well done. And what we learn, we learn we have lots of problems with our <laughs> joints. <and muscles>. Okay. <laughs> the allies were so steep. <laughs> <laughs> In it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Take a five minute break. We're gonna come back and just look at some of the conditions. Yeah, okay. Drop up your water, go to the loo if you need to. We're just gonna come back and look at the conditions, but just take five minutes, okay?
That's better. Okay. You can take some notes if you want to jot some notes down, Natalia, but you will get the chance to do this uh, section when you go to the portal. Again, you'll get videos, etc. So this is just really more of a, not a duplication, but just re-looking at something when you get back onto the portal. So we're going to look at conditions of the thoracic spine. Can you see that, Natalia, on the screen? Yeah. 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 So purpose of sharing this with you is because what happens as soon as you become a yoga teacher and you start running your your classes, however many you're going to do, is that people will come up to you with all manner of conditions, injuries, and you'll become a doctor overnight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, your job is not to fix them, but by understanding what's going on or the condition that they have, you can make sure they're safe in the class. You can offer variations and you can have an understanding of some of the postures that perhaps won't be right for them because of the condition. You don't have to know everything about the condition, but you do need to, your job is to keep your students safe. So let's start looking at some of the common conditions that happen with the spine. So the first uh, image that we've got, let me just blow that up a little bit. Um, you've got an image here on our, ver on our um, visible body image of the vertebrae. The first thing that people can have, um, very common, is osteoarthritis in the spine. And you can see here that this happy, this happy vertebrae here with a nice chunky, Mm -hmm. uh, disc in between this may well be familiar for you Natalia with your back is that what happens when we get osteoarthritis is that that space gets less and less and so the reality of less cushioning a little bit like you were talking about earlier the knees hurt there's less cushioning between the vertebrae which means that the back is is starting to get out of sync but there'll be a discomfort there Along with that, you quite often will get osteophytes, which are also commonly known as bone spurs, which are little tiny bits that stick out mm -hmm. and start to... So what was a really nice cushion structure has now perhaps changed shape a little bit, but also has just less cushioning. And so there's more stiffness, there's less range of motion, and there may well be associated pain. It's also worth saying that this kind of spine that we're looking at here could also be a person that has no pain at all. So mm -hmm. this can happen under the skin and doesn't necessarily cause pain, or it may be that it sits, lies dormant for a long time and then somebody does something and then they go, oh, and now I've got back pain. So the purpose of just sharing this with you is so that you understand, oh, this is, this is a nice clean image, 
the reality of what it looks like under the skin is very different, but the the purpose is the same. If they've got less movement, less cushioning, that range of movement is going to be less and it's going to hurt. So some people will be happy to move their body through that pain and some people won't want to do anything about it because it's too painful. So if they've come through the door and they come into a yoga class, fantastic, because they're going to want to move their body, even though it might not be um, comfortable. So osteoarthritis, you can see here, um, that there's a reduction of the um in in this case i'm showing you that the disc is coming down and is thinning down oh. there's also less wear and tear for the cartilage so the sorry there's more wear and tear so the cartilage is reducing down so the overall mobility is less mm -hmm. um, and less common than osteoarthritis spondylosis um, this affects the bones and the joints of the thoracic spine, causes pain, stiffness and bone spur um, around the vertebrae. It is less common than osteoarthritis, but people may come in. They're probably managing their pain of some description anyway. So if they're coming in, it's not going to be something that's new to them. Um, a lot of this is wear and tear and with, with age becomes worse. Degenerative disc disease. If you were to see somebody and got diagnosed with this, they would say it is wear and tear. Um, over the time of you aging, the discs, the disc space gets less. You get more wear and tear. Um, the discs actually lose water content. So think of them as nice, big, fat, squishy discs. As we age, that gets less. Oh, yeah. And so the whole range of movement of the back, if we're not moving it in, in the ways that we are in yoga, just the range of movement gets less and it's stiffer. Mm -hmm. um, thoracic pain syndrome. So this is a term used for um, pain in the upper or middle back because it's the thoracic part of the spine. Um, and it can be, can be referred pain from somewhere else in the body. Um, and it can also... Um, reading this note this is different. so it's a general term and you'll find this that doctors use this if they're not quite sure what the cause is it's a generic term of thoracic pain syndrome so it's in that area and there could be different types of pain caused mm -hmm. but they're not quite sure ultimately if you've got a stiffness in that thoracic spine looking at remembering t1 to t12 that's a large part of your spine. Your range of movement is going to be less. And again, you're not going to want to do huge amounts unless you're doing lots of physiotherapy or lots of yoga, which will manage it. You're probably going to be in quite a lot of discomfort. So people will come into your class with a known problem and will either have had physiotherapy or been told by an amazing doctor, go and do some yoga, go and do some stretching. You're not there to fix it. You're there to be able to just ensure that they have a nice, safe practice and understand that you know what they've been diagnosed with within range. A very much more um, common uh, condition will be herniated discs. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the thoracic spine, it's less common to see herniated discs. It tends to be the lumbar spine because of that lack of range of movement. The lumbar seems to take most of the um, issues with the spine, not always, but but generally. So it would be it's more unusual for someone to have a herniated disc in the thoracic, not out of the question, but we're just looking at thoracic spine for the moment. And so when that disc is compressed, you can get nerve pain and a weakness to that area. And interestingly, when it happens in the, th the thoracic spine, it can come round to the chest and abdomen. So if they're, they're just experiencing discomfort through the chest and the um, tummy region, it may be related to the back because nothing in the body works in isolation. So it's unusual to see a thoracic spine, not out of the question, but generally you're going to get more lumbar pain, um, lumbar discs in um herniated so may, may, may yes darling go ahead because you start talking about it when i was young uh, i i had a, i was involved in a car accident and my seventh eighth uh thoracic spine discs were compressed 
So ah. I just found right now when you start talking about it, you know, sometimes, you know, it may affect uh, the lower parts of your body. So maybe because of the, it was exacerbated by pregnancy and lifting my children for three yeah. years. Maybe that's the damage, uh, you know, compressed uh, discs I had. Maybe they manifested, exacerbated later and maybe that's what that's what caused my low back pain quite possibly yeah. yeah because when you look at the um if i should just scroll you down here if you look at if you look at the spine yeah if you impact it at one area it's yeah. almost impossible that at some stage it's not going to so if we talk about what you just did there seventh eighth of the thoracic spine it's almost impossible that it won't affect some other part of it, especially when what your body was going through um, carrying your children is under so much more pressure. So it's very possible that that early impact then led to an increased lower back issue for you. Yeah, but I never thought about it. But now you start talking yeah, about it's fascinating, it. isn't it? That's what maybe that's what it is. I don't know. It and healed then... for time. I never had any issues for a very long time. Then as, as I got older, I could feel something, you know, pain. But again, I start being very active and then it, you know, disappeared Interesting. for a while. But now it's all the low back. So maybe that's what it is. And also bearing in mind that what we talked about earlier as well is as you go through the menopausal stage, is that because yeah. everything is reducing, or yeah. what I just like to call it is, you know, all that hydration and that um, estrogen that's keeping everything um, working effectively is, is less. So if you don't put oil in your car, it won't work effectively. And at some point it's going to stop because it's not hydrated. It's not got estrogen by the fact that estrogen is declining in all of the cells of our body, in all of the major organs, there has to be a cause and effect. And so there's multiple things going on here for you, that early impact, the carrying of the twins, menopause, you think about all of that structure, it's being compromised. Yeah. So it's going, and varying degrees, of, if you, some people will just not do anything because it's just too uncomfortable you're knowing you're understanding that actually movement is helping it but people will come with their own fixed ideas into class and, and again that's why encouraging them to move is great but bear in mind some of them will be actually I'm going to hurt myself more which isn't necessarily the case but there'll be a fear factor in there yeah absolutely yeah um spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal so the spinal canal coming all the way through all of the um areas of the spine when that press, when that pressure, if I just see if I can get back up to, mm -hmm. when you've got the narrowing of the spinal canal, um, it tends to be uh, more nerve pain, which can lead to numbness and difficulty in walking. So, again, people may well find that actually if they've got that kind of thing, regular yoga or Pilates or regular movement is helping them, or it might be that they come into your class and you know, they're at their very first stage of their journey and they're in quite a lot of discomfort but they've been told to move it so again gentle movement you'll see one of the benefits of you getting up off your mat as a teacher and walking around if somebody is in a lot of pain doing something it will show on their face and so it'll be right but <laughs> yeah yeah ease up Go, take, yourself, take yourself into child's pose or rest up that's the point of you getting up in addition to making sure everyone's safe is to just check they they're, they're pushing themselves because you've told them to go into down dog or whatever you told them to go into but being mindful that actually going around and going no just ease up we've done enough now you've you've stretched your body very small amounts of yoga will will have a significant effect we are in the very lucky that we do it a lot and so we are able to take our bodies further forward but for people who've never done yoga, a small amount will make a tremendous difference in a short space of time. So it's fabulously rewarding as a teacher to help people move forward, but know that actually very simple things will make a big difference for them. 
So just looking at um, these curvatures of the spine, again, this will have happened, most of these will have happened from birth or through... Um, life. Yeah, through life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stuff that happens. And most people won't even be aware. So unless, unless children have had a scoliosis, which is very common in an early age, and they've um, they've probably used a lot of exercise to manage it all their life, maybe gymnastics, nothing else. Most people won't even be aware until something happens, until another um, disc gets out of place, or they get intense pain. They probably won't even be aware that they've either got a curvature in the spine so when we look at these different spines so we've got the very first one is what they class a healthy spine mm -hmm. the next one here the lordosis is an excessive inward curve of the lower back so rather than this being nice and flat you can see that this is almost protruding forwards mm -hmm. um, and that leads to the lower back muscles having to do more support more work mm -hmm. so they have no choice. They're going to have to keep that structure going in. And to do that, they're going to have to work harder, which means you may get lower back pain. The kyphosis, this is um, an exaggerated rounding of the thoracic spine that we're looking at here. It's also known as a as a hunchback. So it's, it's quite easy to see in older people, but it, it can be at any age, the, uh, the kyphosis. And what's interesting to note about the kyphosis is that They'll be in pain, but also because of it affecting the the um, thoracic, the breathing is compromised. So there'll be a restriction of breath there because of the of the positioning of the spine. Uh, flat back syndrome um, is also known as fixed sagittal imbalance, which is much more of a mouth to get you a word to get your mouth around. So flat back syndrome that's. I'll show you up here. That's almost a loss of shape in the spine. Can you see that's almost becoming really straight? Um, the gentle, the S shape is lost. The reason the spine is in that shape is to help absorb shock and to distribute weight evenly and to help you stand up properly. When you lose that S shape, um, Movements become more difficult. So bending forward, twisting and standing for long periods of time become more difficult. And interestingly, I think it is uh, it was a midwife that we had on one of our back workshops said that the flat back syndrome is exacerbated by pregnancy. Mm. So those again that carrying that weight and then the spine adjusting means that that, that adjustment will limit the range of movement to a certain degrees and then scoliosis which is um if you looked at it underneath uh it's not on this hand it's it's almost the spine is in in a very severe s shape you can see a real curvature but it's an abnormal sideways curvature um this is very common in children yeah. they live with it movement is key but again so i've got clients who've had it since they were children and who are in their now late 70s, early 80s. And of course, that has where the spine is starting to, to gradually weaken because the age is taking effect. Their breathing is, is really challenged. Eating is challenging because the digestive, everything has moved, because I've looked at MRIs, everything has moved to allow that spine to effectively cut, compress all the organs have rearranged themselves to allow that to happen, but it means when you eat that you constantly get almost like an acid reflux because the space for that to, digestion to happen is less. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have a counter effect on the body. And this is the other end of the scale. This person is 80, 81, but the, the scoliosis has been managed for a certain amount of time. And then because she's done less and less as she's got older, it's more it's affecting her more but it's not just the back it's digestion it's breathing it's everything in the body so we've, we've taken a full remit here to someone who's just slipped a disc to severe scoliosis which does affect everything yeah okay yeah sorry any questions on that natalia because that's quite a lot of information we've looked at there go look scary how many <laughs> 
problem. So you don't need to be a me medical yeah. expert. You just need to be aware. aware. Yeah, yeah, because people, oh, I've got this, or I've got an L6 or an L4. Okay, I know what the spine looks like. I know what you're talking about. And I'm just going to make sure that some of these movements, if you're not comfortable, then I'm just going to ease you out. Some mm. of the other things, other um, conditions that are going to come in are, some of them are much more extreme. So it's unlikely um, that you're going to get the full end of, uh, of the scale of this one. But it, the purpose of showing you this is the, um, is the movements of postures that we do. So for example, so bronchitis, somebody who has had bronchitis and is getting better may come back into the class and they may be a regular yogi, but you'll you'll hear the the coughing, you may hear it a bit a bit of a chesty cough, a bit of a mucusy cough. If they feel well enough, then they're coming to, to, to class brilliant. You're just again just going to make sure that if they get overwhelmed that you just they ease up. But if they've done yoga then great, they're probably experienced. For those who've got asthma, obviously the risk of an asthma attack is, is possible. Un, unlikely in a class, but not out of the question. What you find, what I find with students who've got asthma is that movement of the body opening up of the airways, their asthma improves. So I've got quite a few one-to-one -one clients who've got asthma and it's improving because of that movement. So it's interesting to note that that whilst we talk about opening the body, all the muscles, all the ligaments and the tendons and our lymphatic system, the airways that are um, get narrower as you mm. get asthma, they're opening up. So that movement is having a significant effect on their asthma. So never underestimate the power of yoga because it is phenomenal. Because, again, if you're sat hunched all day and you've got asthma, then, then you're not opening those airways, you're not stretching your body and you're not moving all of that. Simple movements may well improve your condition, which to me is just is mind-blowing. COPD, it's unlikely you're going to get somebody in your class with COPD unless it's the very early stages because they really struggle with breathing to the, to the far end of that, that they're on an oxygen mask a lot of the day. So, but they could be at the beginning of, of a COPD diagnosis and it's going to be a challenge on the lungs. So if they're coming and they're moving their, their body and they feel okay, but they have a COPD diagnosis, then all you can do is encourage them to keep moving, but within their range of movement. Pneumonia, again, people will probably not be in your class if they've got pneumonia because they'll feel really rubbish, but to be aware that the lungs may well be damaged to a certain extent when they come back. And although they'll feel better, there may be some um, residue on the lungs. They may just be coughing or being more aware. Mm -hmm. When we start to look at high blood pressure uh, mm -hmm. and low blood pressure, there are some poses uh, in, our, um, in yoga that are better not to be done by people who have, for example, if you have high blood pressure, oh. um, so it's lying with your legs up the wall is sometimes not recommended. So I would always go by um, the student. So I, if I was doing a one-to-one -one and I could check them out and make sure they feel okay, great, I may do that. But they, I also would be talking to them in class, how do you feel? How does it feel? Do you feel a bit lightheaded? Do you feel, okay, back down, you come out of the pose. Because... The heart is working at a different rate. Mm -hmm. We just need to be mindful. And again, that's why you're looking at your students' face. You're checking in with them. Because you've asked them to do it, they're going to do it. Unless yeah. they've come up and said to you, listen, I've got high blood pressure. I'm not going to go mad. And great. Then we'll give you something else to do. With. And, like, and the other end of the scale is people with low blood pressure can quite often find dizziness. So it might be that a lot of forward bends might make them feel a little bit dizzy it may not but it's being aware that don't panic if they get up and go oh, i feel a bit lightheaded they've got low blood pressure that's why get them to sit back rest up and then join them back in there's a lot to think about when you're teaching a yoga class and i'll tell you what 99 percent of the time you're not going to have a problem 
But the purpose of showing you sharing this information is so that you have that knowledge that if someone comes up to you and says, I feel really quite lightheaded, um, it's not a shock because you've already checked in with them at the beginning of the class. Now, people may fall on unwell in your class again highly unlikely but it might happen but if you've already had that conversation hi i'm natalia i'm taking your class today anything i need to be aware of you're a new student um any health conditions any injuries if you've got a new student you're always checking in with them so that now they may, may not choose to tell you that's another matter entirely from your point of view and from an insurance point of view if you've asked them and mm -hmm. they've withheld the information that's one thing but if they've told you that you can be aware and you can you can manage that, that's that is what we're teaching you to do. We know you can do yoga very well. We're teaching you the elements of what makes you a good teacher. And the, one of the main things is to make sure that when you meet a new student, you ask those questions. Have you got any conditions? Are there any injuries I need to be aware of? You know, just as they they may say. I'm epileptic, I'm all sorts of things. The chances are nothing will happen in the class. But if you know you're not going to, part of that shock is not going to be the delay in you helping them in your class. So it's just being, it's good due diligence. It's good to do these as a standard. I still ask students if they're new, I send them a questionnaire. I like to know what's going on so that I can manage it. The very least you need to do is be checking that they have any health conditions or any um injuries so that's high and low blood pressure so um, you okay Jeanette oh, sorry it, go again Tasha foundation uh posture uh down face dog um as I remember it's not good uh for high blood pressure is it correct um I think when I, I was it once I, I made a note um if you I, have blood pressure, avoid the down. Yeah, it, it's all about the the um, position of the head and the heart. Generally, I if I had somebody in my class that had high blood pressure, yeah. I would encourage them because we want them to move, but we also want them to move safely. I would encourage them to go in and then ask them to come out if it became too much. Because again, that face, because what, what we could end up doing is getting them to just, to shorten the whole class, what they can do because because the range of movement um, is suggested they don't do it. You also need to bear in mind that a lot of people don't move at all. That's what I mean about something is better than nothing. So they may come onto all fours, they may come into down dog, and if it didn't feel great, they could come back onto all fours and they could do cat cow or whatever. You absolutely can give them that option. But most people, if they are well, will take it to a certain point and then stop because they know their own remit. Your okay. challenge is to understand where they are. I personally, if somebody was in high blood pressure, I would do down dog, but that's me. And I would be keeping an eye on them. And if they were uncomfortable, they come out. Most people are with, even if you've asked them to do something, will go, actually, that doesn't feel great or I'm going to come out. Or last time I did that in class, this happened. Okay, you go into child's pose, we'll go into down dog. And we'll pick it up but it it is difficult because there's lots of contradictory information and i what i said to you at the beginning of the class when we were teaching um camel mm -hmm. don't teach what you don't do and if you don't mm -hmm. like it don't do the posture end of there's there's thousands of postures you can do so if you don't like it or you you find that you get a lot of students feeling back, oh, I don't feel great when I came out of that, then don't teach it. it. If you're teaching, if I was teaching a menopause yoga class, I know that quite a lot of women with menopause have um, tinnitus and uh, can also have um, vertigo. So I wouldn't put a lot of wide leg forward bend, head down, head down, that I might put in if I was doing a different class, because I know quite a few women suffer with that. And it's exactly the same thing that you would do when you're going out and tailoring your class. Actually, I'm going to not do as much of that. I'm going to add these in and a nice range of movements, but actually I don't like teaching that. Don't put it in. That's the benefit of you teaching. Does that make sense, Talia? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah? Personal approach. Yeah. Individual. Yeah.
Mm. as much as you can in a, in a big class. And then the other information on here, coronary heart disease and strokes, they may have happened. So a stroke may have happened and somebody's come back. This is just really information as to what happens. I really hope it doesn't happen in your class, but it's actually what happens in coronary heart disease, what happens, and angina, heart attacks, et cetera. Just a simple explanation as to what happens. So if someone comes in and says, oh, I've had a TIA, a mm -hmm. transient ischemic attack or a mini stroke, you know mm -hmm. what that means. Yeah. They're stood there and they've recovered and they're coming back to do some gentle exercise. Great. But you're not going to be shocked. Oh, my God, they've had a stroke. I don't know what that is. Oh, should they even be in class? Blah, blah, blah. All of this is just information because we're looking at all the sorts of things that happen in the body. So that's a whistle stop to, of um, conditions. It's not that's not limited. It's just a handful that go with the thoracic spine um, as a guide. It's not limited to that. And again, be curious when students come in and if it's something I've not heard of before, I get them just to explain to me a little bit about it. Be curious. You don't have to have all the answers. You really don't have to have all the answers, but you do need to be aware of what potentially could could be going on. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot in, in an hour and a half. Natalia, any questions for me? Uh... No, it's all uh, good and uh, clear and understandable. And how do you feel about your teaching this morning? Uh, oh, good. So many things to remember <laughs> to tell. Yeah. It's just overwhelming. So many things you should tell. And keep keep the, the pace, you know. Yeah. While talking, you keep the in posture so it's dilemma between giving them explanation and information so they know what they're doing and why they're doing it what benefits and also the pace to keep them you know not too long that's dilemma um, but you did in that in camel you did you started to tell them before you went into the posture you sold them the benefits so you started to explain it before you went into the posture, which allowed you then to talk them through the posture, but you'd already done it. So you are finding your way. You're finding that point of balance by going, okay, I'm going to tell you all the benefits, give you the options of the blanket, and then guide you through the pose. So that you are finding your way through mm -hmm. it. Yeah? Yeah, it's the, it's the balance, you know, between the knowledge and speed. <laughs> You're yeah. doing amazingly well. You really are. And and I'm seriously, that's not me here just saying that. Because if you aren't, I'm going to have to tell you because I, I can't pass you. You are doing amazing well. But I know exactly what you're going through because we put so much pressure on ourselves. You are doing amazingly well. If you take nothing else from this morning's call, you're doing fabulous. And keep doing it. You're well researched. You give me all of the all of the benefits you over deliver when you're teaching so do not worry about that just the only thing i can say is be a little kinder to yourself the biggest battle for me it's uh verbalizing in, in english so yeah remember all the names it quickly and it's it's very very hard for me yeah. i know head i can listen i can understand i can i can repeat inside of me i know what brian says and it's very easy to remember and do it till you have to do it yourself <laughs> then you uh, 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 stumbles you know. but brilliant i mean we're what um six eight six weeks maybe more into it it's fantastic you are but that that's why it's difficult to do it you know it people think that they could teach yoga you know in a weekend it's hard to articulate and it's even harder if English is not your first language you know I see students struggle and English is their first language so you've you've got that and some but you are doing amazingly well so so be kind to yourself and don't panic mm, yeah hard. yeah it is hard it is hard are you um Brian tells me you're going away are you off for, for the next oh, yeah. few weeks yes if, if it's okay with you i um, I have to miss three Saturdays because I can't guarantee. Well, I know certainly first Saturday I'm going to miss. I'm going to be on a train 
traveling for five hours from Moscow to uh, south of Russia. And uh, yeah, to, I think next Saturday as well, I have to travel. I'm not sure if the Wi-Fi would be good enough for the third one. So it's better not stress myself and yeah, absolutely it. absolutely to yeah it, have to do it then something goes wrong and i will be very very upset frustrated so yeah. it's okay with you um may have just three saturdays um yeah absolutely if i can give me the the lessons uh, mm -hmm. and it's just to teach but it's just i will teach them yeah later absolutely i'll i'll continue to send you the the information through and what to teach and then you can practice it practice it okay. and just pick up I'm preparing and teaching myself and i'm planning to go to the gym wherever i can i already researched you know who is going to the gym so i'm planning to bring my trainers and your kids so i will be doing exercises certainly right if yeah. i can't teach, um there's three Saturdays. Is that from next Saturday, Natalia, just so I know? No, not next Saturday. This Saturday after. 21st. Okay. Lovely. Okie dokie. Not a problem. I will make a note of that and I'll just add you into um so that you've got some practicing. But don't stress. Yeah. And take the pressure off yourself. Anything else before we um, wrap up? Because you've done a lot this morning. It's a lot for you to do. It might ask you. Sam gave me oh. homework to do. Uh, if it's okay to ask you, of course. Uh, it's uh, he said uh, find four organs in in our neck. So I, I've looked many websites and many uh, images anatomy of the throat and neck. So he mentioned like uh, gland, not thyroid gland. Uh, what's Pontils? the tonsils? Tonsils. Tonsils. Yeah, and it's not. So what are the, um, a part of thyroid gland, um, this butterfly uh, shape, what yeah. are the three main uh, organs? Because I've got like 16, 18 different, the least 18 organs in our neck and nowhere I can find just four simple organs. No I, I think, I'll tell you what I'll do when I come off the call, I'll send you the image of visible body um i think he means uh the so you've got the thyroid the tonsils yes. and then the adenoids which sit on top of the um tonsils and this is what we call it when we class it as the first line of defense because it goes through the throat the back yes. of the throat but if i send you the image it might make a little bit more sense um and you can then do your do your homework because you probably got it on there but it probably isn't that um descriptive but i would it's part of the endocrine system which is probably what he's referring to um and our immune system effectively i know you can uh the lots of children when they you know when they're children adenoids get removed because they keep inflamed get inflamed and you know especially in cold countries like Russia lots of children they have to right. remove it so it keep them in better health yeah I think I think these days they don't certainly in the UK they don't see any benefit of removing the tonsils now they used to do years ago but I don't think they do no not anymore but that's no. just that's that's um research and Mm. time moves on but yeah I certainly remember children that I grew up with having tonsils removed but I don't think they do it as much now but it makes it there's a vulnerability there if you take that away because of course it's part of the defense system but I'll send you the image and feel free I will take up with Sam the um emails but if you've got any questions just WhatsApp me or email me like you do normally don't don't spend hours trying to trawl and find the answer if it's it shouldn't be that difficult if we haven't given you the information that's down to us so just ask the question, yeah? Well, I don't feel comfortable to bother you um, that much, especially you know, if it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> That's all right. That's fine. That's... Listen, this is all part of us transitioning online. If if we're busy, we won't answer until the next time we can answer. But you're more than welcome. I don't want you 
stressing. I'd rather you ask a question like you did last night and said, I can't find this because we can fix it. It's not, there's no need, there's difficult enough for you to learn all the stuff that you're doing now. If you've got a question that needs answering, just ask, ask it. It's not a problem at all. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Well done. Good work. Thank you. Really good. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank all you right, very much. Take care, Natalia. Bye. Bye.